ma'am? Okay. Okay. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you today Dr. Kathy Bailey, who is the a professor at the Monterey Institute of International Studies. And she is also the president of the International Research Foundation, which is what we're going to talk to you about today. And this is my colleague and student, Ryan Damerell, who's a master's candidate at the Monterey Institute of International Studies. But Ryan is also the administrative assistant for the foundation of the work. So this is, of course, uh, this is our acronym, the International Research Foundation for English Language Education. Um, we are available online to browse at your convenience at www.turfonline.org. And Kat is going to talk to you a little bit about the establishment of TURF. The International Research Foundation was started in 1998 with the seed money from TESOL. The TESOL organization decided that it was important to have a foundation related directly to research in our field. So we were started in 1998 after some serious groundwork by a number of senior scholars in the profession and the organization. And we got um, recognized as a charitable foundation of 501c3 under U.S. tax law in 1999. And since then we've been raising and distributing money for research in our field and to try to influence policymakers with that research. So I'm going to talk to you briefly about TERF's four major goals. The first of which is to implement a research and development program that will generate new knowledge and inform and improve the quality of English language teaching and learning. Secondly, uh, TERF works to promote the application of research to practical language problems. Thirdly, to collect, organize, and disseminate information and research on the teaching and learning of languages. And finally, to influence the formation and implementation of appropriate language education policies, being cognizant of the complementarity of English as an international language and in indigenous languages and cultures worldwide. Okay, so Kathy's going to talk to you about TERF's activities. Okay. This is what tells whose turns, but the lesson plan, right? So um, we undertook to invest our time in activities in three domains, research, development, and dissemination. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our development and dissemination efforts and then focus on the research, especially the research that interests you all that has to do with the use of English in the corporate context. I want to share a quote with you and see if you can figure out who said this. <clears throat> I really like this quote. Investment in education delivers definitely the biggest return on investment. The future of the country will depend on the level of education we provide to our people. In a knowledge-based economy, research is important. So who do you think might have said that? Any ideas? Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama? Actually, Bush. No, this quote is from His Highness Sheikh Nahayan bin Mubarak al Nahyan, who is the Minister for Education and Scientific Research in the United Arab Emirates. And the reason I share it with you today is that the Sheikh gave Turf a generous grant because he really believes in the importance of English language for the development of the Arab world. And he wanted us to support, solicit, sustain research on the teaching and learning of English in the Arab world. So for the past two years, he's given us quite a bit of money and it's been used to support three doctoral students a year at $25,000 each whose research was competitive in a grant vetting uh, proposal process that was quite interesting. Our current focus, what the foundation is working on right now, is related to your particular interests. And this is promoting research and best practices that will improve the use of English in the emerging global knowledge economy of the 21st century. Just looking to see whose turn it is. I think it's still mine. Um, in, in terms of dissemination, we've hosted three dissemination events so far. The first was in Washington, D.C where we brought together international researchers and policymakers to try to identify the research priorities that we should work on first. And those priorities have guided us through the past 10 years. And then um, we undertook a revision of those priorities to add new and emerging topics that were becoming important. We also had an event in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where uh, the participants were largely teachers, uh, coordinators and directors of programs, members of the press, interestingly, and local politicians. And then we had an event in Dubai a few years ago which involved uh, turf board members who were there for a conference. We do everything completely on the cheap. 
we have these events in some place that it's not going to cost us anything. So when the turf board members are gathered together, a group of them, at a conference, we try to have some kind of event. And there was a wonderful possibility at the TESOL Arabia convention a few years ago where they invited us to stay for an extra day. And we had a meeting about research and its importance with a group of supervisors, Ministry of Education officials from six different countries in the region. It was really interesting. As of this year, we funded 37 research projects involving 57 researchers from various countries on a lot of different topics. And I won't go into those today since our time is so short and we want to concentrate on the topic of interest to you. But those topics are summarized on the website, so you're welcome to go and look at those. And so far, we've distributed nearly half a million dollars to researchers in our field. As far as we know, we're the only foundation that's dedicated to research in the field of language teaching and learning. Um, in 2008, the board decided to focus on what we're calling the Key Questions Initiative. And that meant that we first identified some key issues where language and society, language and modern life, uh, interact in such a way that attention is needed. And the one we decided to focus on first, in terms of an investment of time and money, is this thing that resulted in a white paper called The Impact of English and Plurilingualism in, a global co in Global Corporations. It was published in 2009. This focus was voted on by the Board of Trustees, which represents um, teachers, researchers, program administrators, publishers. I think that's it. I think that's our sector analysis right now. And the paper and available, um, the paper and the executive summary are available to you at no charge. You can download these from our website. The paper itself is quite long, and it contains a number of case studies that would be of interest to you. But if you're trying to engage someone who's not from our field, you might find the executive summary useful. Okay, and that's the website. We'll put up the website several times as we go along. Now Ryan's going to talk to you about how globalization has influenced what we're thinking about. Thank you, Kathy. So. First, what I want to point out to you is the networks of multinational corporations that were in place before globalization began. And so what, I, what we have here is, of course, the map of the world. And what I'm going to show you is these networks before globalization. Because we can see that these networks were primarily between uh, developed countries. And this is going to be a stark contrast to what I'm about to show you in just a moment. Before I do so, uh, what I would like to talk about is the percent of non-native English-speaking employees in global 1,000 companies. You can see that in 1996, this number was uh, the number of non-native English-speaking employees in multi, or excuse me, global 1,000 companies was uh, at 30 percent. Throughout the course of 10 years to 2006, that number rose by 20 percent to 50 percent, and in a number, in a shorter amount of time, in 2011, that number rose to 70 percent. So half the amount of time, the same number of increase. So we do have exponential growth here, uh, and this source is the World Trade Organization. So going back to these networks of multinational corporations, we have the same map, and these are the effects after globalization. So just imagine what this might look like after globalization, you can kind of get an idea of how you think it has grown. So we have this, this little kit and ball, or if you will, of these networks just crossing to, of course, so many more, or so much more than developed nations now, uh, in many different countries. Okay. <clears throat> So in terms of the evolution of global corporations and the global human network, we have a timeline from, the 19, from 1950 to 2020. And so what was going on uh, in the, from the 1950s to 1970s was that multinational corporations, uh, regional offices acted autonomously. That is, they didn't have a whole lot of contact with the, global head, with the headquarters of that company. So at that time, local languages dominated the situation, dominated the workforce or the, uh, in the workplace, and English was just being used to, for the contact in between those regional offices and headquarters. So um, as time goes on, global integration begins, and we see that the, the importance of English skills is not yet imperative, which is not the case as of today. So we have this boom in the late 1990s where English, uh, the need for English-speaking employees has risen dramatically. And so at this point, we call it the defining period, where, global, where multinational corporations are adopting global, globally integrated strategies, and also we have this concept of the global human network, which is defined as being connected digitally. So today, English proficiency, non-native speaking uh, employees, is imperative. 
Okay. So the tipping point has taken place in the past five years. I'm going to use the same timeline to exemplify what we mean by the tipping point. What we have here is this blue line, which is the required skills of, uh, for non-native speakers of English. And this red line here is the tolerance for poor English skills. Okay, the tolerance is decreasing, and the skills that are required are increasing over time. So here, the digital connection happens. In terms of digital connection, what does this mean? It means a number of things. First, communication. We have the emergence of email. People are having um, cellular phones are much more prominent than they ever were before. And also in terms of transportation, the world is more accessible through, of course, as we all know, through um, cheaper airplane tickets. We can travel around the world in a day. And so we have this global human network that's being made possible through technology. So naturally, there's a huge English skills gap, which welcomes us to the global human network. People are digitally uh, connected, also globally connected through these digital means. Okay, and building on this point, we're going to talk to you about um, a survey of employees of global corporations today. So this is from some research by a company called um, Global English, which is a San Francisco-based company that does English language training online. And they did this interesting study where they asked employees, uh, about 25,000 employees of various corporations internationally, about their use of English in their work. And 91% of the respondents said that English was critical or at least important in their work. But by contrast, only 9% felt that their skills were sufficient to do the, the, work, the work that they were supposed to do. So this is a really interesting contrast for us as teachers or managers of language programs for corporations. The respondents were from 300 of the world's leading international companies. And you can see some of the companies that are listed there. What the corporations wanted in the face of these English language needs were um, solutions that could be rapidly deployed that wouldn't require a long time to set up and put in place. Solutions that can deliver consistent results no matter the place of the need. You've probably seen this. They That's also a wanted. Pardon? <laughs> That's a problem. It is a problem. They also wanted uh, solutions that would be measurable on a global basis. They wanted to see the impact of the English language training their employees got in various situations. And then, of course, being businesses, they wanted solutions that are cost effective. Hence the balancing scales, because we want quality, but we want it at a low cost, is the message that Global Edge is getting in this survey. There's also the issue that they wanted solutions to be scalable, which means that as the company grows and changes, the solutions need to be flexible as well. I like this quote. This is something that comes as no surprise to us as teachers, but it was one of the findings from the interviews with a number of corporate representatives that our researchers um, talked with in developing our white paper. With employees from diverse linguistic and cultural backgrounds, strong language skills are needed to facilitate effective communication. I almost feel like saying hello. <laughs> okay. Faced with this challenge, of course, global corporations are incre increasingly engaged in talent search and development efforts to ensure that they can attract, keep, and develop workers that can add value to their globally integrated operations. And I'm going to turn it over to Ryan now. I have a question. Yes. I apologize for coming in late, and so if I miss this. Uh, in this survey, did uh, the respondents talk about the cultural differences of their employees? In a lot of situations, the cultural differences were not so big. Because, for example, if you have a, an American drug, co drug company working in Guatemala, the employees are largely Guatemalans. So within the employee base, mm -hmm. the cultural differences aren't so big. It's between the employee base and the middle management that cultural differences sometimes come, that come in. So I work for a global company and where we had uh, meetings across the world all the time. And it, the lack of language, um, the, the culture differences was equivalent to the issues of the lack of language. And so, you know, teachers can uh, teach the language, but without the recognition of the culture, Absolutely. that um, you're not gonna get the, results that the company probably wants. Yeah. So um, I'm just wondering how the company articulated that. They probably, in many instances, don't even understand it. It could be the case. Okay. My, my recollection is that the findings of our study focus more on language needs. Culture came up, but it wasn't mentioned so specifically. Now, interestingly, the, 
the interviews that we did were with representatives of multinational corporations in the United States. So they may not have witnessed the important phenomenon you're talking about at first hand. Or it's the, uh, um, sorry this is cynical, it, it is the typical perspective that I am at the center of the world. Could be. Versus, yeah. you know, there's other ways of looking at problems. Exactly. Okay, all right, thank you. Sure. Okay, so um, some of the 21st century skills that are needed uh, for the United English speaking employees of these multinational corporations. Uh, this quote comes from Corporate Voices from 2008. And let me read this for you. It's, in addition to strong academic skills, corporations want workers with skills and attributes that depend on strong social, emotional, and cognitive development, including professionalism, teamwork, communication, and critical thinking. And perhaps this is a place where the cultural understanding could fit in to some of those 21st century skills. Because what you're talking about is, in, in essence, I think it fits right in there for aspiring professionals. Um, in terms of language development investments, this is also coming from the white paper I'd like to read to you, is that Global English, is, Global English is a company that was founded by one of the Turk Board of Trustees, his name is Reese Duka, and uh, they are a, a company who seeks to help large corporations set up uh, English training programs for their employees. So Global English has conducted case studies of the language challenges, solutions, and impact faced by its global corporate partners. Revenue and cost impact the two main areas where English proficiency adversely affects the corporate bottom line. So what I would like to show you here are a couple of cases uh, which do come from Global English's work. The first one is the case of Reuters. Reuters identified two major needs uh, for their company, the first of which was that they wanted to improve communications among regional offices. So that kind of goes back to the timeline that I was showing you earlier about how uh, regional offices were acting autonomously about 50 years ago. Um, so they're making this move, and in doing so, they also wanted to manage negative consequences of complexity of managing projects across time zones, cultures, and languages. So after employees were trained in English, these are the reported business results, several of them. The first of which is the ability to produce and understand English emails, which is essential in this digitally connected global human network, and that was at a rate of 86%. Um, secondly, they have the ability ability to participate in meetings in English, and that was up 79%. It was up 79% from what it had been before right. the training? Right, right, from before the training. Okay, and thirdly, is the ability, uh, employees had the ability to provide assistance in answering um, questions in English, and that was up 81% from before the training took place. And finally, they had, the employees had the ability to help other non-native speakers in had to use English, which was up 54% from before the training took place. Do you have any questions about that? Just questions about the training, but yeah, the training. <laughs> yeah, we're trying not we to be advertisers too. for global. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so a second case that we want to show you is the case of Emirates Bank. Um, Emirates Bank identified the need to change from a regional to a global company, which is a huge need and something serious to take on. Um, and secondly, uh, they reported the need of having um, English abilities of employees were, or, excuse me, that the English abilities of employees were not at a point where they would easily support the transition from regional to global markets. So in this case, for the case of Emirates Bank, they were still, uh, the local languages were dominant rather than English, which is consistent with the timeline that we showed you earlier. Okay, so after the English training took place, they reported several business results. Uh, the first of which was that Emirates Bank earned the first European Association of Quality Language Services certification awarded in their region. Um, secondly, the increased number of employees trained uh, by over 300% through use of online learning. That's quite a staggering number. Uh, thirdly, uh, was that uh, Emirates Bank had a high satisfaction and completion rates of English programs, approximately 85%, and finally, uh, improved job performance after three months due to improved English abilities. Okay. Can I ask how they measured improved job performance? Yeah. Do you want to talk about that at all? I don't know. This is um, data that we got from Reese Duca from, from the private unpublished materials. I see. You know, Global English conducted research mm -hmm. and he shared the results with us, but I don't have the primary data. I need to find that out because it's actually a very interesting question. It's it a critical question. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It could have been in terms of evaluation, it could the have been, success of the program. Yeah. Did they do a before and after? I will try to find okay. out. 
Thank you. To the best of my knowledge, that information is not published. Mm -hmm. We got it from interviewing Reese, mm -hmm. but it's, it would be really good to have it yeah. in a more tangible form. It's hard to isolate it. Yes. That the English was what contributed to that. Exactly. You know, I, in, For those in of us in this history, English, yeah. Yeah. isolating, <laughs> exactly. you know, in return on investment, isolating the effects of the program from everything else that's going on is difficult and questionable. Let me ask you, I'm just going to circulate a sign-up sheet. If you would, if you're interested, put down your name and your email address, and I will try to find out some of the answers to these questions, and then I can email the information to you all. Okay. Excuse me, Brian. Okay, are we okay to move on? Yeah, we are. We're just skeptics. <laughs> right, okay. exactly. Good. <laughs> if, if, you've, if you've done it, you tend to be skeptical of numbers like this. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. It's so easy to manipulate numbers. Uh huh. Indeed. Yeah. What, so who has it said lies, damn lies, and statistics? Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, cool. That's what, yeah, please, how about okay. you talk about some of these objectives? So this, when we, when we think about the implications of these kinds of findings, the finding seems to say consistently that English language proficiency does improve um, uh, the corporate's, corporate view of success. And we think that for corporations, <clears throat> it's a good idea to invest in English language training, although there are these problems, of course, with managing the outcome, with measuring the outcome. For teachers, and this is sort of where I come in as a teacher, and I've often gotten to teach the courses um, at the Monterey Institute that are designed for the people who are getting their MAs. We have a large MBA program there with a very big international contingent, mm -hmm. and it's a great deal of fun to work with those students. They have immediate needs, and they, they're really highly motivated. They see applications. I got to teach the um, oral communications and professional public speaking class for a number of years. So I think for teachers, especially perhaps those of us that work in higher education or in adult schools or in the corporate context, there's a message that's quite encouraging here, which is what we're doing pays off for our students, which leads me to the last point here, that for English language learners, and my perspective is perhaps um, on, on some level for those that are trying to make the transition from intermediate to seriously advanced to proficient, you know that those last stages of achieving bilingualism are very hard to accomplish. There's a kind of a plateau effect that people experience sometimes. But I feel like telling my learners, you know, keep going. This really will make a difference. If you're going to work for a company, your company will probably benefit, and you will probably benefit from your increased English language skills. So I, I feel there's a sort of message of hope here. That may be very Pollyanna. I probably need a good dose of cynicism from you all, but that, that's my perspective at this no, point. we're all Pollyannas here. We're here. <laughs> we wouldn't be in this, we're in this industry. We're in there must be right. something Pollyanna. So just to tell you about some funding opportunities, and please feel free to spread the word if you know anybody that could benefit from these opportunities. This issue about plurilingualism in the corporate context is one of our research priorities that we're currently funding. And every year we select uh, doctoral dissertation proposals that are worthwhile and that match our priorities that are well written, seem to be well substantiated. And we make um, uh, awards of grants that the students can use for pretty much anything. We have a few restrictions on our budget, but it does help support doctoral candidates. And this year, the deadline for proposals is May 15th. Okay. Um, the doctoral dissertation grants are up to uh, $5,000 each. And the proposals need to address our research priorities. There are many people who have interesting research ideas that don't align with the ones that we're trying to promote right now. So we're pretty particular about the kinds of topics that we're interested in. But those are all listed on the website. Um, this particular year, the proposals that have to do with teacher education, including the issue of non-native speaking teachers of English, um, language assessment, and then this concept we've been talking about, English and pluralism, English and plurilingualism. I knew I was going to do that at least once. I was doing that the whole time we practiced. In business and industry, those are the ones that will be getting preference in the rating this year. The next steps for the foundation, we're trying to seek major funding sources. We're looking at corporate sponsors. We're looking at individuals to try to continue to support and broaden the range of support that we can offer for targeted research issues. And we also are undertaking an effort to influence policymakers. We want to make sure that ministries of education, um, 
state and provincial and national leaders understand the role of language and language development and the importance of research on language-related topics. Um, do you want to talk about this? Yeah. yeah. Um, also available on TERP's website is uh, several resources for researchers. And uh, those are downloadable in Word format. And uh, let me show you a few of the topics that are on the website. Oh, excuse me. Uh, before I do that, if you are willing to contribute any resource, uh, excuse me, any reference list for different topics that have to do with language teaching and learning uh, that would be beneficial for MA candidates, new researchers in the field, uh, you can find the, well, by going to this link, we're happy to accept an email such as uh, these kind of Word documents that we can add to the reference list and help to share these resources with other people. So some of the uh, areas that we have resources for at this time are the ones that are on the screen now. And uh, got a couple more slides, some other topics as well. So you can kind of get a feel for if you're looking, if you're doing research in any of these topics, you're of course welcome to go on to the website and download those lists for free. Here's the last section of the resources for researchers. And these have come from from where? What the topics have come from? The topics are meshing with some of the TERF's priority or some of our uh, the focus of TERF's research prior priorities. And so uh, those are the topics. The reference list themselves have been compiled by different scholars, including Kathy, and uh, they're quite comprehensive lists. And we don't want to stay them? limited to these lists. I'm right. trying to talk people who've written books into giving me the, the Word document of their reference list because mm -hmm. we want to make resources available. I don't know if this happens to you, but so often I get these emails. They're almost heartbreaking emails in a way from young scholars in countries without very many resources. I frequently, you know, on, on a daily basis, I get emails from Iran and Iraq, uh, emails from China particularly, with people asking, can you please tell me what I should read? And this need became so critical in terms of me having to answer emails. I mean, there's a very personal and, and selfish motivation here that I just thought, why don't I just make all of this information available so people don't have to email me. It can be on the web. So I started talking to my board colleagues. Ryan and I began working on this. And we put up as many reference lists as we had. But we don't want to stick with these. We're not limited to these. So um, I, I would like to see our topic range increase and also the number of references on the reference lists available increase as well. And it's a relatively new undertaking by TERF. So for about a couple months three months. Yeah. Three months? Okay. Yeah, so we're definitely looking to add to the resources. If you're willing, please share. All right. Um, a few closing comments. Uh, TERF's initiatives are supporting by contributions from individuals such as yourselves, corporations, and funding organizations. And we're happy to share with you some of the main supporting organizations that have helped to contribute to TERF's work. Can I talk at all about any of these? Yeah, just that, that um, it's, it's been pretty encouraging. A lot of publishers have gotten behind this. We've been really happy with the support from publishers, and quite a few of them are here at the conference in the exhibit hall. I'm going to walk around tomorrow after I finish my talk and say hello and thank them because uh, people have been really uh, willing to think about the impact of research and how we can more systematically support research and apply the findings for research in our field. So those are some of the contributors. We mentioned earlier that the 2010 doctoral dissertation grant deadline is May 15th. We'd be really happy to entertain proposals from, from uh, young researchers. Now, I just want to point out that the researchers, do, the applicants, do not have to be CATESOL or TESOL members or U.S. citizens or anything like that. This is an open international um, competition. They just have to be advanced to candidacy in a legitimate doctoral program. It can be a PhD, an EDD, it doesn't matter. And I don't know if the term advanced to candidacy is used in all countries. It basically means that they've completed their required coursework and they've had a research plan approved by their faculty committee. So a little bit more about the doctoral dissertation grants. Um, the proposals will be accepted. Uh, well, the topics that the proposals will be accepted for are listed on the website. I'm sure primarily right now is focusing on teacher education, language assessment, and the topic that we've been talking to you about today, English and Proto-Anglicism. And, uh, this is our brief commercial yeah, message. Yeah, uh -huh. So yeah. if you're interested, this is an all-volunteer board. None of the board members are paid for their work. We appreciate donations online via credit card. I'm happy to take donations via check either today or 
you're feeling extraordinarily generous. I can't look at Elke because she's just finished her master's degree program, so I know that she's still paying off her student loans. And we also um, accept, of course, mail-in checks. And as, not as a board of, or as a member of TURF or a board of or a trustee, excuse me, of the board. Um, I'm, I've always been very impressed with TURF's ability to limit their overhead, and board members do pay for all of the travel expenses that they incur. So I think that that's a very notable piece of information. To Dubai. Well, the Dubai, the Dubai trips and the Sao Paulo trips, all those things were paid by the conferences. So TESOL Arabia paid for the trips to Dubai. TESOL Brazil paid for the trips to... We're trying to really make, what's that expression, the two birds with one stone philosophy, you know, really capitalize on the travel budgets that are available. And Turf has different levels of supporters. Are there any founders or benefactors in the room right now? Kathy would love to take you out to lunch. <laughs> right. <laughs> we should take her out to lunch. <laughs> Okay, and again, this is the website, and you can also find the mailing address if you'd like to donate or write to TURF online. Further information of our website.